Mel, and I'm one of the pastors here. I'm going to get my things to work. And my husband and I run Victory Kids. That's where Simon is today. Hey, you know our kids are starting a new thing, so you should ask them about it today. They're doing like their own version of table spaces today. They've got a mystery person coming along that's going to share an awesome testimony of how God's worked in their world. And then they're just going to have time to connect because we want our kids to connect and belong and build friends in the house. So when you pick up your kids today, ask them about it and see what it is that uh, they might have shared about their week. I'm excited about it. It's going to be awesome. We are in a new um, season, apparently. It's autumn, in case you didn't know. But I am an endless summer girl, so I'm actually not disappointed with the forecast over the next few days, because I'm quite happy for summer to hang around as long as possible. Um, Maybe it's hanging around for our baptisms next week, because we'd like it to be nice and warm. Shout out uh, to, it's going to be a great Sunday, right? I want you to be there. I might have two of my kids getting baptised, so that is super exciting. So why don't we get there as a community? to support these guys who are taking a really significant step. You know, there's such value in community. I've got to tell you, this is an admission, but I've done a lot of prep for today's message, like a lot. But it just was still feeling, even this morning, like I got up early and I'm still in it, and I'm like, ah, it's just missing something. It's just not quite there yet. And then I come into the community you know, and I'm part of the prophetic prayer prayer this morning and, you know, chatting with the other leaders in the service today and then we do prayer with the whole, like, worship team and, and you know, God just drops things. He drops things in prayer. He drops things through what other people say and suddenly it all comes together. Okay, that's the value of community. You can do Christianity alone. God will talk to you, but when you're in community... He talks to you, like, and it just brings things together. So I just want to encourage you, be in community. Work out your salvation in community because it's so much better. So much better, right? All right. Hey, we are starting a new series today. New season, new series. And it's a little bit of a curveball. Who has been following us on social media? Hands up. All right, we need a whole lot more hands in that room. So if you haven't seen our social media post, it's because you need to like, well, firstly, you need to follow C3 Victory, uh, but then you need to like the post so that they come up. We need those algorithms out there to know that you want to see what we're posting. So that is your homework straight after service today, not now. No permission to get on social media now. Um, But if you had seen it, you would know that our new series is Lent. Lent. It's a bit different. Who here has done Lent? There's a few hands. Who here is currently doing Lent? Hey, hello, up the back. It is actually Lent. Lent started on the 22nd of February, officially. Um, But, you know, it's not something that maybe we have explored together as a church. And so I loved getting Pastor Nate's email that said, Pastor Mel, you will teach on Lent. I'm like, awesome, because I've never done Lent. Uh, It's not part of the tradition of church that I grew up in. Um, But you know what? It's been really interesting. I've loved talking to people and finding out their experiences on Lent. Um, Some good, some not so good. I've loved researching into it. I've found out so many interesting things that some of which I will share with you today, some of which I will let you go and discover on your own. Um, But in a nutshell, Lent is a season of preparation for Easter, right? It is a church tradition um, that spans over 40 days. And in that time, the idea is that you give something up Now, that might be a specific fast, or it might be giving up something that you love. Like, I had heard of giving up chocolate. Like, if you'd asked me about Lent, I would have said, it's something to do with Easter and people give up chocolate. That's, that was the extent of my knowledge pre this moment. Um, So, you give up something that you love, but it's not just meant to be about that. The point is that you also reflect 
in that time on the life of Jesus, right? So Lent leads up to Easter, which is celebrating and remembering the anniversary of Jesus' death and resurrection. And so the Lent season is meant to be about reflecting and having more prayer and scripture. It's got a particular focus on repentance because the idea being if we're thinking about Jesus and his death and his resurrection, we're remembering why that had to happen. And the reason that that had to happen was because of our own sin. So it's this period of repenting and thinking about and and being thankful and looking forward to. I loved um, talking to Pastor Rach this week and Lent has actually come up in her devotional. And one of the ways that they described it was actually as a bright sadness. I thought that was a really, really nice term because see, Lent is about repentance and grief over our sin, but it's not hopeless. There's like, that's not the end. It's not about condemnation. We're not meant to end up in this deep, dark hole where we go, oh my gosh, I'm so hopeless and horrible because there's a brightness to the end of that grieving period, right? Jesus died, but he rose again and he defeated all of that sin. And so now you can actually be completely free from your sin and walk in relationship with God, right? Brightness. I liked that. A bright sadness. And so Lent can be and is meant to be this valuable season of preparation. And so I was thinking in life, well, we do this all the time, right? When we have a significant event in our calendar, we generally prepare for it, except those last minute people. Maybe you do prepare, but it's really, really quick. But for many of us, if you've got something significant coming up, you put some amount of preparation into it. Now, this year in September and October, uh, we are taking our kids on the trip of a lifetime, I'm calling it, because it will be the trip of the lifetime. (laughs) Uh, We are taking them overseas, which is pretty massive, and they are super excited, because, you know, it doesn't always happen in a family of four kids, but, um, you know, we've been talking about these awesome places we're going to go, we're going to experience different cultures, we're going to go to Disneyland in Paris, and, like, it's going to be awesome. And they're really frustrated, because they want to go tomorrow. (laughs) And I'm trying to explain to them, no, this is so good, like, September, October to them is the end of the year, I have to wait a whole year before I go, but I'm trying to explain, yeah, but we're going to be planning for it and preparing and we're going to look up the amazing places we want to go to and we're going to get really, really excited. It's building like this anticipation and imagine when we finally get to go, like how good is it going to be? I think it's going to make it that much more special and significant because you've waited for it and you've anticipated it. And so the interesting question is, do we do this for Easter? Like Easter is literally the most significant day of your entire like life. Every year, Easter should be. Now, I've been studying Genesis lately, and I love going back to Genesis. Because in Genesis 1 to 3, like your entire worldview is set out. If you believe, you know, if you choose to follow faith, Christianity, your entire worldview is set out in the first three chapters of Genesis. Really, really good to read it and know it. Because you go back to that place and we see that God created us with a purpose. We are not an accidental afterthought. Things did not just suddenly appear, but God had a plan. He made this incredible creation. He made you and I so that we could have relationship with him. And it was this incredible thing. But then, right, then mankind is tempted. Hey, you don't really need God. You can make it on your own. And they choose to disobey God. And then at that point, sin enters and forever separates humans from God. That relationship, that incredible relationship and purpose that God created in the beginning is ended. And then if you read the Old Testament with those eyes, it's awesome. Like sometimes we can read it, I get it and go, well, you know what? I'm not going to battle against the Amalekites today and I'm not in exile in Babylon and I'm not a weeping prophet for the nation. Like how does this actually relate to me? I'll tell you, it's from the first three chapters of Genesis because for the entire rest of that story of the Old Testament, it is building 
anticipation for Jesus. Because no matter what happened, humankind could not save itself. It didn't matter how good they were. It didn't matter how many rules they had. It didn't matter what type of nation they were. They couldn't save themselves. Which is why the prophets, right? I'm giving you a Bible history in two minutes. Which is why the prophets get so excited about, you know, these little verses about this one who will come. There's one who's coming. There's one who's coming. Finally, Jesus comes and that entire prophecy makes sense. And our entire humanity is changed in that moment. From then on, God so loved the world, he sent his only son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. At Easter is the moment that everything changes. Humanity is restored. And from then on, if we believe... If we choose to put our trust in him, then that relationship is restored with God. Like, it's awesome. This is super significant. My holiday pales in comparison, right? The greatest birthday that we could ever celebrate, the greatest job that we could ever work for, the greatest anything pales in comparison to the significance of Easter. And so the question is, how do we prepare for it? Do we spend more time planning our four-day camping weekend slash Easter lunch, getting the best Easter eggs for our kids? Like, it's not in a bad way, but do we actually spend more time planning all of that than we actually do internally preparing ourselves for Easter and does Lent actually have some value therefore in this space for us or is it it could be is it just an empty tradition that is the question that we are going to explore over the next few weeks and my assignment today was to okay let's set the foundation Let's get a bit of a picture of what Lent is. So if you're like I was four weeks ago, then you're going to learn a few things today, which is going to be exciting. You might be surprised at how much you already know. Like, I didn't realise, but when my kids did Pancake Tuesday two weeks ago at school, that that's a part of Lent. I've seen Pancake Tuesday all over social media. I had no idea. Are you guys all shaking your head at me? I had no idea that that was part of the Lent calendar, okay? It's Shrove Tuesday. Shrove comes from the word shriving, and it's a British tradition, like a British part of Lent. Uh, It's one of their ways that they're outworking it. Shriving means to just go and confess your sins and have someone listen to you. And so it was the day before Lent started, people would go and confess their sins to the priest um, so that they would be prepared to start Lent, right? That's what Shrove Tuesday is. And the reason it became Pancake Tuesday is because they're about to start a Lent fast. So they want to get rid of all the fat ingredients in their house. They need to get rid of the milk and the eggs and the sugar and the butter. So they started making pancakes. That is Pancake Tuesday. There you go. Did you know that? A few, maybe, no? I found it super interesting. Now, I'm not going to say this one because it's controversial, but you can go up and look up how Europe celebrate the day before Lent. It's called Fat Tuesday, and it has a... uh, Yeah, anyway, go look it up. What's Fat Tuesday in Europe stand for? Uh, You'll be surprised, like I was. Uh, But they have festivals and big feasts. It was all a celebration prior to beginning their very strict Lenten fasts on Wednesday. Which brings us to Ash Wednesday. Not, Not fires. Okay, so Australians will think of Ash Wednesday as fires, but actually it's a part of the Lent calendar. It's the start of Lent for some. You'll also hear Clean Monday. There's an Eastern and a Western thing. Not going to go into that, but depending on whether you include Sundays in your fasts, you have slightly different start and end dates. But let's stick with Ash Wednesday is the start of Lent. And the ashes are to do with like a Jewish concept of ashes, death, dust to dust, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So it's that beginning of that mourning period where you are starting to reflect on the consequences of sin, which is death, okay? That's Ash Wednesday. Fish Fridays. Everyone heard of Fish Fridays? 
So, Fish Fridays. Uh, I mean, most commonly you probably hear people will only eat fish on Good Friday. But Fish Fridays are also a thing. Um, so, the Roman diet, if you were rich, you got to eat warm-blooded meat. But if you were poor, you only ate fish and vegetables. So, part of the Lent feast, often people would give up their warm-blooded meat and go back to a diet of fish and vegetables. And then as time goes on and, you know, traditions change, people don't want to do that all the time. That's a bit much. So we'll just go to Fridays, Fish Fridays. Um, And then the Good Friday correlation is that Jesus was warm-blooded, right? So we don't eat warm-blooded meat on Good Friday in remembrance of Jesus. That's where your Good Friday fish comes from. There you go. Um, I learned just this week from my friend Leonie, who's here today, purple. Purple is apparently associated with the colour like of Lent because it's associated with penance and sacrifice and preparation. So often purple is involved in um, some of the, oh, I guess, practices leading up to Lent. Um, Palm Sunday. Now, I did know this one because I grew up in the tropics where there's 10 palm trees in everybody's backyard, right? So Palm Sunday was always a big thing where we'd have palm leaves in church and we'd remember what happens on Palm Sunday? Jesus coming into Jerusalem. Awesome. And that is the beginning of Holy Week, which is the final week of Jesus's life. And in Lent, you would really reflect on the events that are happening in that final week. Um, until you get to Maundy Thursday. I think I'm saying all these right too. I had to like play the pronunciations <laughs> to make sure that I'm saying it correctly. Um, but Maundy just means to remember the instruction, like Maundy is instructions or commands. And so what it's doing is it's remembering the Last Supper when Jesus was giving instructions and commands to his disciples. And that is the end of Lent for people who are starting on Ash Wednesday. Some people also end on Good Friday. Some people end on Holy Saturday. Um, But you would know the last couple, like you know Good Friday, right? Hopefully we all know Good Friday. (laughs) No, Pastor Simo, Good Friday is when we remember Jesus' death on the cross. Um, And then Easter Sunday... We all know that one, right? This is when we celebrate his resurrection. All right, so have you got the Lent calendar down pat? Right? They are all the days. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that's all very well and good, but is it actually biblical? Like, did somebody just come up with a really good idea somewhere and start doing this thing called Lent, and now we just all do it and we don't have a clue where it came from? Or does it actually have some biblical correlations. Good question, right? Good question. You won't find Lent directly in the Bible, okay? Obviously, Jesus is probably not going to do it because it's about Jesus, but we don't actually see it directly referenced in terms of name by the early church, apostles. You know, we don't see it as a part of that, Um, but rest assured it is deeply correlated, so stick with me on this one. It is actually first mentioned in a letter from, hang on, Athanasius, I think I've said that correct. Um, It's around the fourth century, right? There's this council going on where they are debating the deity of Jesus. Is he actually the son of God? And in this, there's this letter from Athanasius, who is a very staunch defender of the deity. And he talks about this practice of Lent, which had this element of fasting so that he would remember the significance of Jesus's death and resurrection. And then obviously over time, we find it throughout church history. You know, documents talk about Lent. Um, And most of you would know, maybe. No, actually, I didn't fully know this. But there's like fasting, obviously involved in it. Okay, so church tradition has this fasting. Um, And the reason for fasting, there's lots of different ways you can fast. You can go and look that up if you're super interested. But the reason for fasting And the reason for the 40 days of fasting relates back to the 40 days of Jesus' temptation in the desert directly after he was baptised, right? So we're going to open up a scripture. You'll be happy to know there is some scripture in today's message. Matthew 4. If you've got your Bibles, you want to turn there. We are going to read the first two verses of Matthew 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. And for 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. I love that bit. 
I love that the Bible is real. <laughs> like Jesus wasn't some, I don't know, supernatural being who just fasted for 40 days and felt amazing. No, the Bible says he was really hungry. Most of us can't fast a day without being really, really hungry. But Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he was hungry, right? And Latin, the Latin word for Lent means 40. So it's, it's in reference to these 40, and it's in reference to the idea of testing. So throughout the Bible, there's a lot of significance on the number 40, in terms of testing. So there's other people who had fasted for 40 days, like Moses fasted for 40 days before he got the commandments, and Elijah fasted, is walking um, to Mount Horeb, and there's other things of testing, like the Israelites wandered for 40 years through the desert, like 40 and testing, they're kind of correlated throughout the Bible. Right, but Lent specifically focuses on these 40 days because we're looking at the life of Jesus and we're remembering him. And the devil comes to Jesus and he tempts him in the exact same way that the devil tempted Eve and Adam, like way back at the beginning. He comes to Jesus and Jesus is physically weak, right? We need to remember this. He's really hungry. He's physically weak and the devil's going, hey, you know what? You can just turn these stones into bread. You don't have to trust God. Just make it happen for yourself. And you could jump off this building here and tell the angels to save you. Like, you don't have to trust God to look after you and protect you. And do you know what? If you want all these kingdoms, I'll give them to you right now. You don't have to go through that whole cross thing. Just take it now. But you just have to worship me. It's the exact same temptation. Just disobey God. Trust in yourself. Come over and serve me. And it's going to be awesome. But what Jesus did that's different is obviously he did not sin. And Jesus responds back to the devil in like an amazing, spiritually strong way, right? He is just confident in God. No, I'm going to trust my God. Like I have a food, he says, I have a food that's way better than any kind of bread. Oh, we should write that. Like that's a message right there. Like, would you get, some of us would love bread so much that potentially we would like go for the bread. <laughs> like, if we're really honest, I was thinking about how I would respond to the devil in all of these tests. And look, I'd like to say I wouldn't go for the bread, but I think that I wouldn't be as restful and strong as Jesus. I would have been like, oh no, I just got to pray some more and then God's going to drop some bread out of the sky and then I'm going to eat it. And then when he comes to me and he's like saying, you could jump off this building and I'd probably be answering oh no I just have to fast and pray some more and then I'll trust that God will protect me like I would be responding not like Jesus let's be honest he had this like just calmness and this restfulness and he was spiritually strong and so that's this part of Lent we're meant to be reflecting on Jesus we're taking away the physical things in our world that sometimes distract us they keep us satisfied with stuff that actually doesn't matter. Like Pastor Darren was joking about, you know, he wants a Tesla. Maybe it was a joke. Maybe it wasn't a joke. I don't know. But in the end, a Tesla won't actually satisfy you. And maybe part of the lesson is God teaching us that a Tesla won't actually satisfy you. But I believe with you, Pastor Darren, you can have your Tesla. But there are things we fill our worlds with that satisfy us and we miss the spiritual hunger which is actually where our strength comes from, right? And so then we end up spiritually weak. We might be physically strong, but we're actually spiritually weak. And so Lent is like this interruption in our world to stop us relying on ourselves and to focus on God. Sorry, my thing just disappeared. Which is why Lent is not only about fasting. Lent is meant to be about giving up something to actually do something. Remember, you know, we used to talk about freedom from, which is great, but you have to actually be free into something, right? We're fasting because we're stopping something so that we can invest more prayer, more scripture, more silence. We're in this place of repentance. And there's this beautiful picture of Lent that actually comes from the Old English, meaning, which is to lengthen. And it's this lengthening as you move from winter into spring, the lengthening of the days. And so a part of Lent is absolutely about slowing down, recognizing that maybe there are things in our life that are a bit frozen and we need to release them 
We need to let them go so that new life can form. Like that's what happens in spring. New life forms. Jesus' death and resurrection on the cross reminds us that everything can be made new. So what are the things in our lives that might be holding us back that we actually need to let go of to enable God to bring about that new life? There's this incredible spiritual correlation with this whole idea of Lent. And so I share this with you and I go back to the original question. Does Lent have value? Absolutely. The underlying heart behind Lent that we would intentionally dedicate a season of preparation in our own hearts for remembering what Easter is all about. Like that has incredible value. The practices of Lent are incredible things that we can do. And as I was praying about this, I just felt that God said, this is like, it could be, could be a holy interruption. Could be a holy interruption in our lives. Because if you're like Pastor Darren, I get it. March, term one, right? You have this beautiful, relaxed summer holiday, maybe. It's summer is relaxing. And then you get back into the term, like if you've got school kids in term, like term one's a blur. You are just trying to get through, and there's all those permission notes coming and activities, and you're like, ah, have I signed it all today? Like literally 12 to my inbox the other day. But hey, at work too, like you might be at work and it's all like, right, we've got to get into the year and we've got our strategic plans and our visions and this is what we're going to do. And historically, this time of the year is go, go, go. It should be when you've got all this energy, go, go, go. And Lent comes in and says the exact opposite. Slow, (laughs) stop, listen. And so it could be a holy interruption. And I could have just finished this message here. This was the bit that I just couldn't sit on until this morning. Because there's just something else though. Because we're just like, so go, 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 go. If we're not careful, we'll go, okay, let's awesome. Let's go, 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 go. Right, I'm going to do a vegetarian fast. and I'm going to get up and I'm going to pray for an extra hour in the morning. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And we're just like added 20 hours a week to our schedule of practices, which all have good intention. But here's the key. It's not about the practice. It's meant to be about who are the practice leads us to. And if the practices of Lent don't lead us to Jesus, then we've missed it. There actually is no point to the tradition. I want to share a story. My husband has given me permission. He's not here, but he has given me permission. All right, so we've been married 15 years, which is awesome, right? This was our recent celebration and we're still working it out. You're always working it out, right? And so we've been having these conversations about connection. Oh, he loves when I talk about connection. (laughs) But kudos to my husband because he is very intentional when I ask for something. So when I say to him, honey, I feel like, like our lives can get so busy and we're flying from one place to the other and I miss connection, just the little connections with you. And he's like, okay. And so he institutes a check in call. And so then, like, every day I'm getting this phone call. Hey, how are you going? Good? Awesome. Just want you to know I'm thinking of you. Hang up. (laughs) And this, like, went on for a couple of weeks. And I'm like, that's awesome. I love that you're intentional about checking in with me. But it doesn't actually build relationship. (laughs) It only works... If the check-in has space to actually connect and to actually build relationship. And if I feel like it's just a practice, I've got a ring, done, do, do, tick a box. It hasn't actually achieved the purpose. So we had a good laugh. And you know, sometimes the check-in call only has 30 seconds. That's okay. 
but there's now space to actually listen to the response that's, I need something more. I need to talk about this. I want to share this with you. And I, God just spoke to me so much about Lent in this. Lent is meant to create space in your world. So then the question back to us is, are we actually interruptible? Like, do we actually want the interruption? Like, be honest, because that's going to take sacrifice. That will actually take time. I'm going to put a scripture up. Thanks, Richard. I did talk about it. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Do you know Lent, at the foundation of all that, you're going to hear lots of things about some amazing practices of Lent, but at its foundation, it is not about increasing your burden with all the right things now that you should be doing leading into Easter. Because Lent is actually about that verse. Lent is an invitation to that type of relationship. Like the type of relationship that you can actually rest in. The type of relationship where you're not striving to try and make yourself better, but you're actually coming to Jesus and going, I, I just need more of you. I want to connect with you. And I want to create space in my world, right? And we know that God promises He will meet us. Like it's all through the Bible. If you genuinely seek God, He will meet you there. You know, Proverbs says, I love all who love me. Those who search me will surely find me. There are, that's just one scripture. There are so many scriptures. And so the, I guess what I felt like the Holy Spirit was wanting to ask us today is, are you interruptible this season of Lent? Do you want to be? Are you hungry for something beyond just religion, something beyond even just where you're at with God? Like, are you hungry for more of God? Maybe you do feel weak. Like, maybe you feel like you're running 100 miles an hour. And so the invitation from God is, hey, don't add something more to your schedule. Let me interrupt your schedule by giving you a space to rest where I can actually speak into what it is that has got you wound up so high. I'm going to speak into that. We're going to swap burdens. I'm going to take that off you and I'm going to show you a way of life that's way different. Maybe that is your invitation this Lent. But equally, maybe some of you sit there and go, I hear about relationship with Jesus every week. And I'm just not feeling it. Julie's feeling it. I just also felt that there was an invitation today into the awkward. Sometimes relationships look awkward. Sometimes they just take a little bit to get off the ground. Right? Sometimes trying to have a relationship with a supernatural being is just awkward. You're allowed to ask the question. Because otherwise you'll just keep doing all the practices that you think you should do and you will expect that eventually some lightning bolt will fall out of the sky and you will be this, I don't know, have this incredible relationship with Jesus. But Jesus wants you in the awkward. He just wants you to come to Him and say, all right, I'm going to read this scripture. I've read it a hundred times. I haven't got anything out of it, but God, I want to hear from you today. Read the scripture and then stop. Sit in the awkwardness of that space.